In this lesson, we're going to fix our broken force diagram. You'll recall that the chart when on first page load is fully broken. It appears in the top left corner, and these circles seem to be centered around like the midpoint of zero, zero, but they're definitely not what we want to see. And then if we resize the window, we do start to see the chart that we want, but there's this weird resize behavior. It's like laggy, sometimes it doesn't resize. And the culprit for this is most likely reactivity and how we render these circles as it relates to how the page loads, how Svelte works behind the scenes, and how it tries to update reactive variables. And as a refresher, these updates, these reactive labels are what are responsible, right? The dollar label is how we tell Svelte to basically watch for updates and update if and when something changes on the right side of the equals sign. So. The reason that the circles are at first populated in the top left corner and then update when we resize is most likely due to the reactivity in our X scale and in our simulation. You see, on first page load, we're rendering a series of nodes right here on line 57 that by default are going to be positioned in the default for simulation layout, we could assume, which is in this top left corner. And to verify that, if I removed all of these other forces and then clicked save and refreshed, we would see that they appear in the top left corner and they stay there if I resize. Now, what is that confirming for me, right? What that's confirming is that this line eight, simulation being a simple force simulation of data with no other forces applied, that is what creates all of these dots in the top left corner. Remember that's true on page load and on resize which means that the first time that the page is loading, this is essentially what we are rendering. Svelte is not paying attention, for some reason in its internals, to our force X, force Y, or force collide. And so what we then know is that there's some dependency complication, there's some conflict between Svelte's internals and how it wants to render reactive variables and how D3 force simulations work. So in my investigation and what you'll find in other examples of Svelte and D3 force diagrams is that we can't just expect this to work by making the entire thing reactive. The other problem with this is that simulation itself is going to be reinstantiated every time that a dependency on this right side of the data changes. So in our case, if and when X scale changes because of the width updating, this will reinstantiate the entire simulation. And you may be asking, what's the problem with that? Well, the issue is that's why we have this weird resize behavior because Svelte is basically recreating this complicated force simulation that has all of these dependencies that's trying to do all of the math and physics behind the scenes. And it's re-rendering that simulation on every single tick, on every single second that the width is updating, that X scale is updating, that any of these dependencies are updating. So the TLDR here, the big takeaway in summary is that we don't want to create simulation with a dollar label. We instead actually want simulation to be its own simple variable that is bare bones in nature, that is basically only equivalent to this. And then we want to use what's called a reactive block to update the entire simulation's physics itself, rather than reinstantiate the simulation, we want to update the simulation's dependencies and therefore its physics in its own separate block. And for that, we're going to take a look at what are called ticks in a force simulation. A force simulation is composed of multiple ticks. And a tick for this purpose can be thought of as a frame of animation. And so this great example from Ben Tannen basically illustrates each frame or each tick of a force simulation. Now, at the first tick, at frame zero or frame one, all of these circles are randomly assorted. And you'll remember that in our visualization at frame zero, everything is in this top left corner, okay? So this is tick zero or tick one, if you wanna index there. And what you can see is that as we progress through the animation, as each tick progresses, these circles get closer and closer to their desired endpoint. So it starts at random points, they converge on what looks like here, a X axis of zero. So there's a force Y bringing everything to zero. And so you can see this dynamically, how a force simulation actually plays out using physics by playing the simulation. You'll notice that a lot of it is very front heavy. Most of the simulation animation actually occurs in these first 20 frames. And then the rest is kind of easing into play. 
And this is all about certain properties that we can specify like decay, power, strength. We'll get into that below. In our code, we're not using ticks and that's a problem. And that's why everything is rendering in this top left because it's rendering it on tick number zero. So now that we're aligned on that, we can answer the question, how do we solve the problem? And the answer is on tick. The question is, what do we want to do on tick? Let's go back to our code and let's review what we're doing now. Right now, the simulation is this entire block. And then we instantiate nodes just once here at the bottom. To make it more clear, we can actually bring it closer to the actual simulation. And what we want to do instead of this, because of the issue that we've already identified, is we want to update nodes any time that simulation changes. And the way that we'll replace this to start off is by making nodes an empty array by default, and then listening for any tick by writing exactly the code that we just saw, simulation on tick, and then resetting nodes to be equal to simulation.nodes if and when the simulation ticks. So the big difference here is that we're no longer updating nodes anytime simulation itself changes. Remember that that's this entire object. We're only changing it whenever the simulation ticks. So let's go ahead and save that and see what happens. And we can expect to find some errors, particularly because simulation is undefined. Now, the reason for this is because there is a dollar label preceding simulation, as we've already identified. Now, you might think that we could do something like this, but then you'll notice a bit of an issue with resize. And so the reason for that is because <laughs> it's a pretty bad issue. You definitely don't want to do this, to be clear. The reason, again, is because we are simply reinstantiating this complicated physics-based simulation object over and over again every time we resize the page. That's not what we want to do. Essentially, we want to let the force simulation itself handle the internals here. We do not want to reinstantiate the simulation. We want the nodes to be redeclared based on when the simulation ticks. So we don't want to use dollar labels because that recreates elements. So let's remove this. And now we realize if this has to be, you know, not prefixed with the dollar label, so too does the simulation we declare on line eight. So let's start off and go ahead and just call this let simulation rather than dollar label, or we could do const. Now by default, we're going to see the same error that we encountered last lesson. X scale is not a function. What we actually need to do is simplify how simulation is constructed. Rather than this entire block from line eight until line 21 being our simulation, let's make our simulation only line eight. For now, let's comment out the rest of our simulation and click save. Now by default, you see everything appears in the top left corner, which is precisely what we would expect. But now what do we want to do? What we essentially want to do is move all of this complicated force logic into its own reactive block. Now, what is a reactive block? As you can see here, essentially you can put more complex logic like this entire if block in a dollar label and it will update if and when anything on the right side triggers. So here, for example, if and when count then passes 10, we can trigger this entire block. And we want to do a block like reactive statement for our force simulation. The question is, why are we doing that? Basically, the simulation itself is very simple, but we want to update the simulation. Remember, we don't want to reinstantiate the simulation. We don't want to recreate it. We want to update the simulation if and when any of these dependencies change. So let's go ahead and uncomment this. And rather than put it directly in the simulation construction on line eight, let's open and close a reactive block, which essentially looks like that. And let's move this entire complicated force logic into the block. And then we need to basically just write simulation and then the rest of the code and hit save. Automatically, you'll see that our chart is in fact working. So what's different about these two bits of code? You'll recall that in the first version, we had this dollar label in front of simulation, which tells Svelte to recreate simulation if and when anything on the right side of the equal sign changes. In our new version, we are only instantiating simulation one time at page load. That's why it is a constant. It's never being written over. But what we are doing is applying these additional arguments like force X, force Y, and force collide to the simulation if and when it updates. And we're doing that with this reactive block. 
which essentially says if anything in this entire block changes, then go ahead and run what's inside. So whenever we resize our window, for example, or whenever X scale is updated on first page load, uh, that is what triggers this entire simulation to run. There are a few other things we're going to need here because as you can see, if we resize, there's a bit of an issue. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it doesn't update all the way. It's also just not working. And the reason for this is because we need a few other arguments that are commonly applied to force simulations um, to get these bubbles to really ease into their actual positions. And there are going to be three parameters that we're going to pay attention to. One is going to be alpha, which we're going to basically write the amount between zero and one, or the rate at which the simulation finishes. So basically, how much movement do we want? How fast do we want it to be? The second is going to be alpha decay, which is going to be the rate at which the simulation alpha approaches zero. So basically, between simulation states, how long does it take? And then the final one will be restart. And restart is probably the simplest of them. This is what tells the application to restart. So by default, obviously this isn't going to work because we need numbers. Let's go ahead and put some numbers. Let's do one. 0.01 and restart doesn't take an argument. Now, if I resize the page, you'll notice that we don't have any breaking errors. You'll notice that the visualization doesn't look perfect, right? It's a bit choppy, but it's no longer causing these app breaking errors. And really to get it to a production ready standpoint now, all we need to do is adjust these numbers to be a bit more reasonable. So the question of what our value should be for alpha, alpha decay, and restart really depends on personal preference and on your own testing. You can go ahead and look up some documentation for each of these three. There's a great notebook here which basically shows the different parameters. Here you can see all of these arguments, alpha min, alpha decay, velocity decay, alpha target, and alpha, and we could change any of these numbers to test how things change. This is a good kind of visual illustration as you can see, I just broke the application by putting too high of an alpha target. Um, the point being that you, you probably need to play around with the numbers to see what works. Spoiler alert, I've been working on this for a little bit, so I know which numbers are going to work well here. Um, I found that an alpha of 0.3 and an alpha decay of 0 0.0005 tend to be the numbers that we want. Now if I refresh this and move, you'll notice a lot better of a visualization with very few issues, pretty good movement, pretty dynamic, feels pretty good. Overall, there are very few issues with the visualization itself. Again, you could play around with these numbers and make them whatever you want, but you might notice that some work much better than others. So this is going to be personal preference. I'm going to go ahead and add some writing that I have put together for what these mean so that you can review them. And then the important thing on the last line is restart. This restart parameter basically tells the simulation to update if and when any of these um, operands change and this entire block triggers. So again, I would recommend you play around with the numbers, but as you can see here, we have a smoothly resizing application, which even on really tiny screens would still look pretty good because it's using D3 physics to basically make sure that no bubbles are overlapping, they're respecting one another's space, and they're arranged via physics. The high level summary is that we moved all of the complicated force logic out of the initial construction of simulation and we moved it into its own reactive block. And the reason for this is so that we do not recreate simulation every time, we simply update it. That's specific to D3 force, right? Updating a simulation, these parameters being tacked onto simulation at the end is specific to D3 force. But we definitely don't want to be recreating simulation over and over and over again. We only want to update it based on these forces if and when X scale and Y scale change. So we have one simulation that's updating its internal physics engine and all of these forces if and when it needs to, which led to this much better looking responsive reactive visualization that actually appears correct on initial page load. If you want to keep learning about how to build real world apps with the latest technologies and other career related topics, then start right now by subscribing to our channel and liking this video.